Hey, it's Rachel Cook, your modern mentor. I'm the founder of Lead Above Noise, a firm specializing in activating workplaces. We help leaders and teams crack their activation code to achieve top performance and engagement. Whether it's a leader bootcamp, a keynote, or a pulse check, we've got you covered. In this week's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Beth Message. Beth helps individuals, teams, and organizations get from where they are to where they want to go through collaborative coaching and consulting and personalized strategies. She is a brilliant coach and a talent and learning advisor, and she is full of insights and solutions to fuel you forward. In this episode, we cover the power of clear boundaries and expectations, the importance of setting norms and boundaries that serve the group, and brace yourself we talk about the real cost of not taking your PTO. This one is hard to hear. Okay, so here we go. Enjoy. All right. Well, Beth Message, executive coach and consultant specializing in learning and development and talent. I am so excited to have you on the Modern Mentor Podcast today. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, I'm really happy to join. This is, um, you know, I think we both work in a similar space. And so it's always great to have these kind of conversations with, with other practitioners. Yes, absolutely. And it's it's part of why I invited you on. You know, I, I do spend a lot of time talking to authors and experts who specialize in areas that are a little bit different to where I focus. I think you and I kind of complement each other in some ways. And so I'm just looking forward to seeing where we bring the conversation today. Yeah, same, same. Awesome. So Beth, you and I, in full disclosure, have known each other now for probably even less than a year, we met at a conference. And I think we just had one of those mystical connections. I am going to be rolling into year 10 next year, I think, in terms of running my own practice. But you are still a little bit of a baby in this space. And I mean that with all due respect in terms of tenure, not expertise. Um, but you, you left the world of corporate a lot more recently than I did. You lived in it during, during the pandemic, during much more recent times. Um, I'd love to hear just a little bit about um, what triggered your decision to leave corporate and, and what are you really hoping to sort of change or drive or focus on as an independent practitioner now? Yeah, so it has, um, it's been about a year and a half since I officially started my business, which um, feels both like an incredibly short time and an incredibly long time. It's, um, so it's, it's a little bit of both. I spent, you know, I spent my time in corporate, in learning and development, in talent management, working largely in the retail, hospitality, startup space, always really enjoyed it, never thought I would do consulting. And I think the thing that started to change for me, um, I had always done coaching as part of my work. I did go and get an official, like officially get training at Georgetown to become a certified um, executive coach. And I thought, you know, maybe I will do that on the side a little bit, right? And then during the pandemic, I decided to leave my full-time corporate role because, you know, what, what better time to look for a full-time job was during a pandemic. But I decided that I wanted to do something different and just ended up through that process doing some consulting, thinking it was like an interim thing, um, and then went back into a full-time, you know, permanent corporate role, permanent in air quotes, corporate role, and decided like, oh, no, I actually liked that consulting. And the thing, here's the thing that I like about it. I love the space that I sit in. I'm, you know, I'm a learning nerd. I'm a lifelong learner, learning and development. Like I would do that. I do that in my, my free time for myself. And while I really enjoyed working in the companies that I did, I found as I got more and more senior, less of my time was actually spent doing the practitioner work. More of it was spent on the managerial tasks, the leadership tasks, which I'm good at and I enjoy to a point, but I really wanted to be able to pivot and focus exclusively on the practitioner work. And the other piece is I really love getting inside different companies. I do a lot of work in the retail space because I've got that as a background, but I, I work across all sorts of different organizations. And that feeds my own learning and curiosity as well. I really like to work, you know, really understand the organizations and the people that I'm working with. And so, um, yeah, so it, it kind of feeds different um, growth for me as well. Well, awesome. And congratulations. And uh, we're lucky to have you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I'd love to get your perspective a little bit. So you and I chatted a little bit ahead of the show, and we are going to talk 
a little bit today about this idea of focus and setting boundaries and how do we kind of collectively, the royal we, how do we almost separate a little bit of signal from noise and how do we find ways to move forward when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling like there's chaos around us, when we're feeling like maybe not everybody else is doing what we want them to do, when we're feeling under-resourced. There are a million things here, right? And I think we're going to get into that today. Um, but I would love to start with a question around learning. You you describe yourself as a lifelong learner. And maybe this is a nice way to sort of segue into that conversation because I think this idea of lifelong learning is something we hear about all the time. We all know we're supposed to be doing it. And yet we are operating in this world of a lot of chaos and not enough resources. And so before we get into a conversation about kind of boundaries and finding control, talk to us a little bit about how do you how do you infuse learning into your day-to-day and how do you encourage clients, leaders and organizations to do the same? Yeah. Um so like I was the kid that always had a book with me. I'm the adult that always has a book with me, right? Like I can entertain myself very easily. Um, so some of it is just that kind of very practical stuff. Like I read all the time and I read novels. I read nonfiction. I read newspapers. I read, you know, trash on the internet. Like I read all sorts of stuff. Um, I listen to podcasts. So I'm delighted to be on your podcast. You know, I'm a curious person in general, like travel is one of the things that I really love. And that's, that's part of the learning, like going to a new culture and really immersing myself. But you know, I think the thing that's changed for me, or maybe evolved is a better word for me, over the years, as I think about learning. So there's that piece of like, actively taking in external information, synthesize it, internalizing it, right? There's another piece of learning. And this is where I find over the last several years, I've really spent more of my time and I'm encouraging both individual clients and and teams I work with. And that's actually the reflective learning, the, the taking a step back and, you know, either reflecting on the thing that I just learned, reflecting more broadly on, you know, what am I doing? Well, where am I getting stuck? What do I want to do differently next time? You know, I work with a lot of people on career growth. And when I ask them questions around like, well, what do you want to do next? Or what are you interested in? Uh, And I don't say this critically, but a lot of times, a lot of times people are like, well, I, I don't know. Like I haven't stopped to think about it. Oftentimes we take in so much information. We don't actually take the time to stop and give ourselves a little bit of time and space to process it and decide what we want, what we want to do with it. Like, how do we want to apply it or maybe not apply it, but at least make that conscious decision? Yeah. I think that there is so much intelligence in there. I remember a couple of years ago when I first heard the term procrastinate learning, are you familiar with this one? Mm -hmm. It's so good, right? Because when we, when we, when we feel the urge to be busy, we feel like we need to be consuming or, you know, quote unquote learning or taking in versus taking a step back and saying, you know what? I read three books this month before I read a fourth, let me really think about what did I take from these books? What am I going to implement or test or put into practice? Um, And I think, and sometimes that doesn't feel busy. It feels quiet and that can make us uncomfortable. But I think I love the way that you are broadening the scope of what qualifies as learning. And I think that there are ways that if you, you know, if you've just finished a project at work, taking an hour to sit with the team and really doing a debrief on what served and what didn't serve, that both qualifies as being busy and productive and also learning. And so learning doesn't always have to live in a classroom. That's what I'm kind of taking away. For sure. And to your point, you know, I think we're always trying to move forward. I think pausing and reflecting helps us determine if we're moving forward in the right direction. Absolutely. Running really far and fast down the wrong path serves very few people. Very true. Very true. Awesome. Okay. So learning is a top priority. It's something you do for yourself. It's something you encourage your clients to do. Let's talk about what else you are seeing with within some of your client organizations. What are some of the challenges you feel like you are supporting leaders or teams or individuals through right now? Let's start there. You know, I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anybody. Nobody has enough resources. You can be a multi-gazillion dollar company and you still don't have enough resources, right? The the amount of work and the amount of resources aren't matching up. And, you know, I think this is where some of that pausing and reflecting collectively and individually becomes really important, right? Because there are a few things. Number one, everything cannot be the same priority. 
you know, if everything's the same priority, you're going to move a few balls for like a, a couple inches forward and not really accomplish anything versus saying, this is the one we're going after. We're going to move this one all the way down the field. And these others will come. And by the way, these we're not going to do anymore. Right. And so I think, you know, this idea of like, what is truly important and are we actually collectively deciding that? And are we actually collectively then agreeing where we're going to put our time, effort, and energy, I think is a big piece of it. And I think the, the close companion to that, and it, well, the, the overarching bridge of all of this, right, is change, right? So people are moving through a ton of change and they're still doing the same things that they've done in the same ways that they've done them, even when it frustrates the heck out of them. So there's, they're seemingly the same amount of work. There are fewer people, there are fewer resources, but we're still going to prioritize everything the exact same way and still try to get everything done to the same level with fewer people. The math of it doesn't work. So what are you, what are you advising? What are you counseling? What are you facilitating within these organizations? And I'm, by the way, I'm seeing all the same things, right? I feel like a broken record talking about the need to be prioritizing collectively at the top, across functions, across silos. Um, 10 years into my practice, I feel like I'm still preaching it. So maybe you can teach me something really essential here. How do we, how do we start to really lovingly force leaders into that conversation and that discipline? Yeah, I think it's a few things. I think, you know, if we're looking at the sort of macro level of organization or even broad team, I do think it is that prioritization and doing the work around being really clear and being able to tell our teams, you know, I, I always, I always kind of chuckle and I've been, I've been internally in companies when we've done this before, we're like, here are priorities for the year. And you're looking at like 27 different things. It's like, not really. Right. So I think it's, leadership teams really getting clear on what are the priorities and then communicating that. But then as it seeps down both individually for those leaders, but then seeps down through the teams, the way that that work is getting done is going to get done is by people playing their role and focusing on the things that they can control. Right. I hear a lot of, and this is not just in my consulting practice. This isn't through my entire career of yeah, well, it would be done if she did this, or it would be easier if this person did that, or if, you know, our team, our team is doing what we're supposed to be doing, our cross-functional partners, they're not doing, and then there's this laundry list, right? And look, yeah, it would be great if everyone did everything that they're supposed to do at the level that they're supposed to do all the time. But the reality is we focus on other people's behavior, which we cannot control, right? So one of the the things that I really talk to teams about is this concept of a locus of control. So think of a really simple model. Think about like rings on a tree and there are three rings. So there's that internal core, there's an outer ring, there's a secondary ring and there's an outer ring. The internal core, it's the smallest ring for sure, but that's the things we can control a hundred percent, right? The furthest out ring is the things that are like, this is just beyond us. Like these are bigger organizational things. These are the things that we cannot shift, cannot move, can't control. And then there's a pretty broad middle ring that are things that aren't entirely in our control, but we could really influence and influence pretty effectively to move in the right direction. A lot of the times people, leaders, teams are spending their, the bulk of their time on that outer ring, the things that they cannot control. And it's frankly just not a good use of time. They're squandering the time that they could be spending on the things that absolutely they control and then really where they can influence moving the needle. Yeah, I, I love that that visual. Thank you. And I think it's it's very easy to sort of get hung up on those things, right? To to sort of to put it bluntly, to use it as a little bit of an excuse. Well, since since that thing completely out of my control isn't going to change, I guess I just can't get this thing done. I guess I just can't make it happen. Since my partner who's supposed to be collaborating with me just isn't showing up, I guess there's nothing I can do. How do you help people, Beth, whether it is people at senior levels or even people more on the front lines, even individual contributors who seem to be living in that mentality of kind of disempowerment? How do you encourage them to sort of think beyond like, okay, you cannot shift or move or change this, but what can you not necessarily control, but influence? Are there any sort of like 
guiding questions or exercises that you use to help them think about what might live in that second, that middle ring? Yeah, for sure. Um, I really love doing this with teams because I think you know, we can think about this stuff individually, but it's the collective power of different perspectives that really can be the unlock. And so I'll do an activity and we can, I can either give people like sheets at their table, we can do PowerPoint or, you know, flip charts at the beginning, at the, at the front of the room. And it's literally like, we're going to draw three rings, draw a central ring, a, 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 a core ring, a middle ring and an outer ring. And then I'll, I'll just challenge them, um, you know, sit at your table with your team and start filling them out. What is the, What are the things that are 100% in your control? The things that I, the way I like to start is what's 100% in your control? What are the things that are 100% out of your control? And then what are those things in the middle? And the things, the trends that I see, a lot of times people don't put enough in that, that core ring of things that they can control. It's often stuff that they almost take for granted. And so they don't think about it as things that they actually have 100% say over. And it's really important to identify those because that is often the lever that you use to influence in that middle ring. So not really being clear about the things that they can control is definite trend I see. A second trend that I see quite frequently is putting stuff in the middle ring that absolutely should be in the outside ring. So I'll see a team say like, you know, we could, um, you know, I'm making this up, but like, we could absolutely influence the mission of the company. I mean, really? <laughs> like, or if you could, that's like a real long term prospect. Unless the company has said we are changing the mission and we are crowdsourcing and blah, blah, blah. You're probably not going to change that. Um, that is going to be the outer ring. And so put it out there. And stop worrying about it or put it out there and decide like if this is something that it's super important for us that like I cannot continue to move forward here if this is what the mission is, then that's an entirely different discussion. But when you can really identify the things in the outer ring and say like it is diminishing returns for you to keep pushing that boulder up the hill, that's really important. Okay. So that's that's really helpful. And that sounds like it would be amazing, Beth, to have you at the front of a room facilitating that. But if a company isn't so lucky, that sounds like something a team can do together with with themselves, with each other, and, and just kind of lovingly push each other and then focus on what is in that middle ring and, and find ways to to influence. Yeah. And I think, yeah, look, like, like some paper and markers, you're good to go. This is not high tech. I also just think some of the language, like developing a shared language, when someone, you know, in a meeting and someone's like, well, we should do X, Y, Z, having a shared language to say, is that something in our control? Uh, No. Is it something we could actively influence? Mm. Okay, let's continue that discussion versus, nope, something we can't control, we need to move on. That is really interesting. Do you have any advice for a team who feels like there are some things in that outermost ring, things that are not within their ability to control, but that are so kind of damaging or constraining to their ability to get their work done that they have to confront it? I think you have to get really clear, you know, is it something that truly is never going to be able to move from that outer ring to to that middle ring? If it is something like product assortment, so let's say you're a company that creates, you know, that, that has a product line. And, um, you know, the, so here's the classic example, right? It's whatever, early 2000s, you work at Blockbuster and Blockbuster is saying, nope, we're, we're sticking to the, you know, the VHS tapes. That is the way of the future. We are not changing that. And if you're looking at it and saying, no, we have to influence this or the company is not going to, to, you know, to continue on. I think really getting clear, is this critical? Is this a personal opinion or is this business critical? Okay, if it is business critical, then what are you willing to do to try to influence it? And then what's the point where you cut that off, right? Like that's a really extreme example, right? But it's certainly one that I think most people know because um, as we're aware, Blockbuster did not t- did not probably make the, the correct choice there, right? Um, now right. Netflix and streaming rules the world. But, you know, I think, really getting clear, is it business critical or is it sort of a personal thing? Because sometimes it's just like, well, I actually would prefer that we're doing something different. Okay, that we're looking at something different there. 
And then deciding, you know, saying like, we do think this is business critical. And can you build the coalition around that? Can you build the stakeholder um, support around that? And like, actually then actively working on it, as opposed to wishing that it would change. Like, I think there's a decision point where we need to say, we are going to actively work on this and make this part of our priorities versus we're just going to keep saying we wish this would change and never actually try to move the needle. Yeah, Beth, that really resonates me because I see that a lot in organizations. And I'll confess, I remember being part of that mindset within organizations back in the day when I was still working full time. There was this like, almost like we would attach ourselves to this feeling of helplessness and there's nothing we can do about it. There's an expression that we use. It has like a gentle profanity in it. And we like to keep this show family friendly, but there's sort of like, you've got to do something or get off the pot, right? And it's like, Either you're going to do something about it or you need to stop complaining about it, but you you can't just keep hovering in that middle place. Um, It's just unproductive and a waste of time and energy. So I think that's a really helpful reminder. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I also want to ask you about, so we've talked a little bit about the importance of prioritizing, the importance of understanding what we can influence, what we cannot, Uh, but you mentioned, and you're spot on everybody seems to be operating right now in this mode of too much to do, insufficient resources to do it. Yeah. So we have talked about some of the overwhelm we're experiencing from the lack of prioritization, maybe from the lack of role clarity. We also talked a little bit just about the state we're all operating in with so much to do, so much going on, really just not enough resourcing to get it done. And I think prioritizing is important. You know, aligning is important. Having role clarity is important. But but what else? What other bits of advice or counsel are you offering leaders, teams, individuals when they're just feeling like I just don't have the tools and, and enough stuff to get it done? I think boundaries are really important. At the team level, I think that look that's things like norms and ways of working, almost like service level of agreements, things like, you know, we expect people to be responsive to email between 9am and 5pm. Anything beyond that, we know there'll be, you know, people won't be responding. We expect, you know, 24 hour response rate or 48 hour response rate, right? It can be things like, you know, obviously return to work, working from home, hybrid, that, that all is a big discussion as well. But it, it can even be things like, um, we are a culture that we do use Slack for X, we use email for Y. I mean, all of those kinds of things. Um, because what that does is, and it's email is the, is the really big one, right? Well, I sent the team an email and they haven't responded. Well, when did you send it? Five hours ago. I mean, is it an emergency? Did you say it was an emergency? Well, no, but they should be like, they should be responsive. So really just having some shared understanding of the boundaries of like, this is what it means to work on this team. Or if you're an external team, this is what it's going to be like to work with us, I think is really important. And I often find the teams, the individuals on teams think everyone has the same shared understanding and they really don't. That's really interesting. So how do you help teams kind of come together and maybe make some of these agreements? And then and then equally, how do you help them sort of implement these agreements within the broader organization? Yeah. Yeah. So on a team level, I mean, oftentimes it is like we're going to come together and do a working norm session. And we're going to, I mean, it can be everything from, oftentimes I find this really falls around meetings. You know, I think meetings are... Uh, going to be, you know, are sort of the bane of most people's corporate existence, because there are just too many of them. And people are saying that, like, we're meeting so much where there's not even time to do the work. And so it's things like, what do we meet for? Who gets to be in those meetings? And I think it's so funny, like, no one wants to be in any of the meetings, and then they're just like, sad or offended, or they have FOMO if they're not, they're not invited. Things like, I won't go to we will not go to a meeting that doesn't have an agenda. Um, we will we will make sure that there's a um, scribe that takes notes and we get really clear and we, we end every meeting by saying, what are the next steps and who owns that, right? It's things like that, that there's, you know, you really have to sit down and just talk through. And it, it doesn't mean you have to sit down for hours and hours. You can do these in some fairly simple sessions and you can just do them even as a team yourself and your team meetings. 
but you, you do have to do it, right? Like assuming everyone has, that everyone's going to come to the same conclusion is, is not necessarily going to work. And I think your other question there, I, I think around how do you implement that in the broader organization? The one thing I'd say before I answer that is when you determine it for the team, make sure new members of the team get onboarded to that of like, hey, we are a team who you know only does meetings for X. We handle these kinds of questions on Slack. We, when we do a, a full team meeting is for this kind of information, a you know, a weekly touch basis for that kind of information, like making sure you onboard new members of the team to that. But then really sharing with the broader organization things like something simple, like, you know, we will always have an agenda for our meetings. Oftentimes, the best way to socialize it broadly with others is rather than expecting them to meet your norms is to share what you will do as a business partner. So as a business partner, if I am owning a meeting, if I'm the one setting it, I will always make sure you have an agenda, a minimum of 24 hours in advance. And once you set that behavior, oftentimes you don't have to ask other people to do it. They will kind of be like, oh, well, I mean, every time I meet with Sally, there's an agenda. I mean, I'll just provide an agenda. It's sort of influencing your way into changing that behavior. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's a really helpful example. You know, I I often find myself reminding my clients that a lot of us walk around with a little bit of a hero complex, right? It's like if a leader asks us to do something, we always want to say yes. We always want to be the hero. We we want to solve the problem. But sometimes we have to remember that we also are agents of the company that employs us, and part of that means preserving its resources, right? And so You know, I've seen examples within organizations where a senior leader has some sort of monthly stand-up meeting, right? And the team sort of puts together some kind of presentation for that meeting. And at some point in the journey, that senior leader comes to recognize that this meeting that she may have assumed was taking an hour or two of prep time was actually taking 30 or 40 hours of prep time. And when we shield senior leaders from these realities, because we're so busy being the hero, we don't give them insight into how much resourcing they are squandering on things that aren't that impactful. And so I think think it's really important for people to shift their perspective from, I'm complaining, I'm not getting it done, to, no, I'm being a protector of the very limited resources this organization has, and I'm helping to preserve them. I totally agree. And I think then the, I think the other companion point to that is you are also a protector. We all are individually are a protector of our own resources, our own time, our, our own energy, our own attention. And, you know, this is where, um, I talk about this, this comes up with my coaching clients all the time. And I, and I, and I come from my own personal experience. I'll just give you an example. It was 2016, 2017. I was working in a corporate role. We had a massive, massive, massive project that was kind of taking over everyone's lives. And that year, so we had a very, um, we had a PTO structure, right? You get paid time off. And at the end of the year, you could roll over 40 hours to the next year, but anything beyond that that you hadn't used, you would lose. And that year, I lost 60 hours of PTO. So what that means? a hundred hours of time off that I didn't take 40, I could use the next year, 60, I gave back. And I still, like, I still, as I talk about it, I have like a very visceral feeling about it. And at the time I was like, this is crazy. I can never take my time off. This is ridiculous. And I sat down and I, and so I was salaried at the time. I didn't have an hourly rate, but you can figure out your hourly rate, right? I did the like, salaried 52 weeks, 40 hours, blah, blah, blah. And I got an hourly rate and then I, I multiplied it by 60. And I looked at that number and it was not a small number. And I thought, I essentially looked at my company and went, you know what? You don't have to pay that to me. I'll just keep, working. don't know that you can use that more than I can. Right. I think I could actually quantify it. And I thought to myself, like, no one told me I couldn't take that time off. Right. Like the PT, like, yeah, the project was crazy. We had a lot going on. No one told me I couldn't take that time off. And while I may have had to negotiate specific days or like, could I take 
two weeks versus one week. When I really thought about it, I'm like, I am the reason I didn't take that time off. And I just thought to myself, I'm never doing this again. And, and I haven't, right? So, you know, flash forward, like I, travel is hugely important to me. I'm a consultant. I get, you know, I get paid based on working, not that we don't in a corporate environment, right? but, um, but I took a two week vacation in May. I'm going to Japan in October. I have another vacation, you know, I have more time off planned later in the year. And it is really important to me that I take that. And so the way that I do that is I talk to my clients and I build it into our project plans. I make sure they have advanced notice. I let them know when I am and am not available. And I make sure that the work that I owe to them, maybe I have to get some of it to them earlier in order to be able to take that time off. But I've never had a client say like, oh, well, no, those two weeks, you can't know. You cannot take that time off. You cannot travel. As long as I'm getting my work done, as long as I'm delivering for them, and often I'm delivering something earlier or ahead of expected in order to make sure that we can, I can prioritize my time, everybody's good with it, right? And so I think it's another thing of like what's in our control. I talk to people a lot about this. You're frustrated at work because you, you know, whatever, you feel like you always have to be on. What would happen if you're not always on? Oftentimes people can't really answer that question. Yeah, I think we all tend to hold ourselves to a standard that is just not really reasonable. And and at the end of the day, everybody loses when we do that, right? Because you you gave that time back to your organization. But on the flip side, your organization probably got a really exhausted, burned out version of you that probably wasn't doing work as well as you could have been doing had you taken that time to step away and refresh, right? Yeah. And it's absolutely true. And I have this conversation often where, you know, it'll be someone saying, Oh my God, I'm just so sick of, you know, responding at emails at 9 PM. And I'll say to them, well, why are you responding at 9 PM? Well, someone sent me an email. Okay. Was it an emergency? Well, they didn't say it was an emergency, but they expect a response. How do you know they expect a response? Cause they sent me an email. Well, okay. Yeah. They, obviously they expect that you're going to respond at some point, but like, What would happen if you don't respond at 9 p.m.? What would happen if you respond at 10 a.m. the next day? And, you know, we kind of just go through this, okay, but what would happen? But what would, and and oftentimes I'll ask them something like, well, would it be, let's try it. Is it safe to try? Is it safe to try tonight at 9, you know, if you get an email or the next time you get an email at 9 p.m. or after 6 p.m., let's say that any emails after 6 p.m., if you don't respond to the next day, is it safe enough to try that? and, and not respond. And it's oftentimes we have to give ourselves the permission. You know, I, I heard, um, there's a consultant, her name is Betsy Talbot. I I don't know her personally. She does work in communications, but I had heard her at one point say something that really landed with me. And she said, you know, everybody I'm paraphrasing, but she said, everybody thinks that boundaries are for other people. Boundaries are for ourselves. (laughs) I love that. And said that, I was like, oh, yeah. It's kind of like, I'm not putting the fence up to keep everybody else out. I'm kind of putting the fence up to keep myself in. <laughs> that that really resonates. It packs quite a punch. I like that one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Beth, we have covered a lot of ground today, and I want to respect your boundaries around the length of this conversation. Um, Before we wrap things up, though, is there anything that just feels kind of pressing or urgent for you that I haven't asked about that you want to share with the audience before we sign off? You know, I I, I agree with you. You covered a lot of territory. I, I don't know that there's something pressing that we haven't said, but the thing that I would just encourage everyone to do, if you do nothing else, right? I hope you have a lot of tidbits from this and try things. If you do nothing else, um, just create a little bit of space for yourself to reflect on a, and a, on a regular basis. And that can literally be 30 minutes while you have coffee in the morning. It can be while you're on your commute where you're just not doing anything else. I mean, you can be drinking coffee, right? But like where you're not also trying to listen to the, you know, listen to a podcast or trying to, you know, balance your checkbook or whatever, but where you're, you're literally just kind of checking in with yourself and create just a little like, how am I doing? 
Do I need to like, what do I want to keep doing? What do I want to stop doing? Just some simple questions. Because I think that's often the learning that we are not tapping into. Uh, and we absolutely have it within our control. I think that's a really lovely reminder. And it's, it's something we all can control, right? Something to give a try. So thank you for that call to action and that important reminder, Beth. And thank you again so much for being on the show today. Yeah, it was great talking with you. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Beth. You can learn more about her and get in touch via her website at bethmessage.com. Join me next week for another great episode. Until then, visit my website at leadabovenoise.com if your workplace could use an activation boost, a boot camp, a keynote, a pulse check, you choose. You can follow Modern Mentor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Find and follow me on LinkedIn. Thanks so much for listening and have a successful week. Modern Mentor is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Dan Firebend. Our director of podcasts is Brandon Getches. Our podcast and advertising operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. Our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchings. And our marketing and publicity associate is Davina Tomlin.